I've beaten Dark Souls, this game should have been easy for me. But it got me thinking, how do From Software keep their games challenging for masochists like me who keep coming back for more without ramping up the difficulty so high that it would be impossible for new players to dive in? And after going back to Bloodborne and feeling like a golden god, it dawned on me. The successive games in the Dark Souls universe aren't defined by the new challenges that are added, they're defined by what the creators take away from you. And that's what makes each one special. In this video, we'll look at the key differences between each of the Soulsborne Euro games, and how From Software crafts an experience for returning players by taking away what was comfortable and reliable in prior games, forcing you down an even more narrow path. There are plenty of features that track across each game in the series, so we're not going to talk about those. But we will talk about what frequently changes in each successive game, and that is build variety, healing, defense, leveling, and multiplayer. So let's look at how From Software raises the skill ceiling without artificially punishing you, starting with Demon Souls. You have a heart of gold. Don't let them take it from you. First, let's talk build variety. This may have been the very first Soulsborne game. <clears throat> Get out of here, Kingsfield. Oh. But it was the last one that I played, and I was stunned by how much variety there was. There's over 200 non-unique weapons when you consider all the variants you can craft. There's mercury weapons, tearing weapons, quality weapons. Have I not been using quality weapons this whole time? Other than using miracles, healing in Demon Souls is done by eating grass. All different kinds of grass. I'm just gonna show up on the green screen. <laughs> While this does allow you to be strategic about saving powerful heals for when you really need them, it also allows you to farm as many healing items as you want. If you don't mind some nominal item weight, you can roll into a boss fight with 99 heals in your pocket and be basically immortal. Oh. On defense, you have shield, magic, miracles, and dance. Leveling is done in the Nexus, the game's hub world which is disconnected from the game similar to The Hunter's Dream, where you chat with NPCs, upgrade your gear, and trade your souls for sexual tension. Then touch the demon inside me. I will remain by your side. Then touch the darkness within me. Would you ever think to love me? Where did you get that finger? And finally, the multiplayer works if you're one of the eight people who successfully got a PS5. Got something that might interest you. So Demon Souls had a lot of variety for players, and a lot of ways to tackle its challenges, and a lot of it was beloved. But not everything would survive the refining of those features that occurred when Bandai Namco took notice of the cult following surrounding Demon Souls, and offered to fund From Software's follow-up game, a little project called Dark Souls. Be safe, friend. Don't you dare go all day. Dark Souls was an unofficial sequel, largely because Sony still owned the rights to Demon Souls, but this was a chance to take what worked in the first game and build an experience around what they knew players enjoyed. But that meant From Software began taking away from what they felt detracted from the adventure they wanted you to have. First off, build variety. While quality builds lived on in our hearts and wikis, many weapon builds from the previous game didn't officially make it to Dark Souls. So Dark Souls separated out pyromancy to allow for any build to use certain spells, and centered stat builds around strength, intelligence, faith, and weakness. Healing in Dark Souls changed from letting you hoard grasses to your Estus Flask, a rechargeable healing potion that resets on death or resting at a bonfire. But it has a fixed number of heals for every run. You can upgrade it to add more, you have some other ancillary healing items, but you can only bounce back so many times before the boss orders you to get good with a hammer. Beyond the change to healing, defense is mostly the same as Demon Souls. You can cower behind a great shield while your summon beats a boss for you, you can cast magic or shoot arrows from a mile away, you can throw literal poop over a fog gate to kill a boss. You can take a level at any bonfire instead of needing to flirt with your new firekeeper waifu. Oh. And multiplayer still included co-op and invasions, but without world tendency, there would have been little reason to participate other than the fun of making new players miserable. Why do people love this game? But Dark Souls introduced covenants, allowing you to join a team, giving you the option to rank up your standing by rewarding you for helping your fellow players defeat bosses or ganking them out of nowhere. Now we get to the weird part of the video. Do we continue to the next IP or follow Dark Souls sequels? And this choice is important because Dark Souls 2 is the exception that proves the rule. Bearer of the curse, seek misery. Three years after the debut of Dark Souls 1, expectations were high and Miyazaki was focusing his attention on a new IP for Sony. So a different team at From was tasked with building Dark Souls 2. While you could label the changes between Demon Souls and Dark Souls as removing what was frustrating for players, Dark Souls 2 introduced several new elements that made the early game significantly harder. The players started Dark Souls 2 with just one shot of Estus juice instead of five, meaning players could make far fewer mistakes if they want to succeed, or use the new consumable life gems, which were plentiful and could be used while moving but disappear 
disappeared after one use and did not respawn and were not easy to farm, so healing and retreating became a critical choice. A new agility stat was added which affected the speed of performing actions, like dodging in the middle of a battle, meaning you started with fewer invincibility frames while rolling until you invested souls that might have gone into vitality or endurance into pumping this back up to the default in Dark Souls 1. And finally, you may notice that upon death, your life gauge does not refill all the way. In fact, every time you die, your life bar shrinks down until it eventually hits 50%. It refills to 100% if you become human again, usually by using a human effigy, which is Dark Souls 2's version of humanity sprites. While human effigies are plentiful, they are technically finite. So if you start running low, you don't have many options other than to join the Covenant of Champions and make the game even tougher, burn a bonfire ascetic to make the game even tougher, or use the altar in the Shrine of Amana, which you don't gain access to until pretty late in the game. So if you're struggling early on, using your human effigies to replenish your life bar could make your game... Say the line, Bart! ...even tougher. Yeah! The community received these changes as adding artificial difficulty rather than raising the skill ceiling, and you all hated it. So when Dark Souls 3 came out in 2016 with Miyazaki back at the helm, these controversial choices were noticeably missing. Fear not the dark, my friend, and let the feast begin. You start with three Estes Gulps instead of one. Life Gems, gone. Agility Stat, gone. Poise, gone. Wait, what? No! Bonfire Ascetics, gone. Soul Memory, HP Degrading, Armor Leveling, gone. But how do you feel about soup? Hmm, so why did Dark Souls 3 have this new focus on faster combat and streamlining builds? What happened between Dark Souls 2 and 3 that made them decide this is what fans of the series wanted? Welcome home, good hunter. While Dark Souls 2 is introducing divisive features to voluntarily increase the challenge for returning players, Dark Souls 1 director Hidetaka Miyazaki was off directing Bloodborne for the PlayStation 4, a new game that took what made Dark Souls a success and distilled down the experience even further to focus on rewarding the player for aggressive combat. Strength remained on the stats list, but dexterity became skill, intelligence and faith were merged to arcane, and Blood Tinge was focused on firearms. Bloodborne had only 26 weapons, although many had two forms, shrinking your build variety even further. Healing saw a big overhaul, Estus Flask, gone, and return to a system similar to Demon Souls. Consumable blood vials for healing. You could pop these on the fly much faster than you could drink your Sunny D, and you could carry up to 20, and they did not recharge on death. So if you use them all in a boss fight and die, you're going back to Central Yarnum for Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Again? However, if you did lose HP in battle, you could regain it immediately by fighting back. It's called the Rally System, where the game rewards you for taking a hit and then getting back up in your enemy's face. In one of the biggest changes to the combat system, your shield was replaced with a gun for parrying. Shields do exist in Bloodborne, but they're nearly useless. Blood Souls are exchanged for blood levels with the Blood Doll and the Blood Dream. Multiplayer is similar to Dark Souls. There's Covenants, co-op for tough areas and bosses, invasions, and although you can't go hollow in Bloodborne, you can be invaded in late game areas without initiating PvP yourself. So why were the changes from Dark Souls to Bloodborne near universally beloved by the community, but Dark Souls 2's new features received a mixed reaction? What Bloodborne added all benefited you. What From Software took away from Bloodborne didn't make the game tougher unless you only beat Dark Souls 1 because of your shield, and the new additions offset the loss. What From Software took away from Bloodborne wasn't necessary to enjoy Bloodborne. What Dark Souls 2 added created more artificial difficulty in the early game by making it tougher to heal and dodge. And what it removed, like most of your Estus or a fixed recharge to your HP, was still necessary to enjoy Dark Souls 2, they just started you off with one hand tied behind your back. Now, an addition doesn't have to be 100% positive. Insight gives you in-game benefits early on, but can make your game more challenging later. Once you gain insight, you have access to level up with the doll in the hunter's dream, buy items in the shop, summon other hunters for co-op, but you eventually activate new enemy attacks or wear down your frenzy resistance, so insight both gives and takes, but it doesn't take from you in the early game while you're still learning how to play. Blood vials work the same, they don't recharge on death. But blood vials were easy to farm in the first zone, faster to use in the Estus Flask, and you began with a capacity for 20 versus Dark Souls 5. One could say that makes them similar to life gems, but one could also say the team behind Dark Souls 2 encouraged you to use their life gems by making your Estus Flask suck. Loyal wolf, take my blood and live again. And finally, we have Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, where we take what worked in Bloodborne and strip away even more. Character creation, gone. You are one character with one build, although you can unlock new moves or buffs with skill points. For healing, you have a gourd with a set number of charges that resets on death that you can upgrade, but it's different from Dark Souls.
because it's brown. But now they've added resurrection so you can literally come back to life and jump back in the fight. That's right, they took away dying. And now we come full circle. Why did I die to the Chained Ogre at the start of the video? Because I tried to dodge. Confession time, I beat Bloodborne the first time without ever learning to parry. Was it tougher? Yeah, probably. But I rarely parried in Dark Souls because I didn't have to. In Sekiro, that is no longer an option. Yes, there are parryless runs of Sekiro online, but why would you do that to yourself? Bloodborne's firearms and rally system are gone here. Sekiro takes away the wide windows for parrying, going back to the system in Dark Souls that required contact. But that system is taught to you early on in a surprisingly straightforward tutorial and then reinforced in every fight. And if you can't parry, the game warns you with a red kanji that literally means danger in Japanese that one of four unblockable attacks is coming. A thrust attack you can Makiri counter, a grab attack to avoid, a lightning bolt to reverse, or a sweep attack that lets you Mario stomp on their head. Bloodborne may have decreased weapon variety, but in Sekiro you only have two swords for the whole game. However, you do have a series of shinobi prosthetics where you throw shuriken, pull out a hidden axe, do a fan dance, blast a flamethrower, frighten animals, finger whistle. Leveling is the most interesting change of the bunch, because you can grind for aforementioned skill points, but they don't increase your HP or attack power. The only way to increase those is to beat bosses. That's right, if you've been complaining these games are too grindy, now you can't grind at all. But you can summon in help, right? Nope. While they later put in ground messages and shadow remnants to help players along, there is no multiplayer in this game. Besides one NPC who charges in headlong to battle and usually dies, you are very much on your own. But that's not your problem, it's everyone else's. You're locked in here with me! With Elden Ring on the way, some of the community's favorite features from past games like stealth and multiplayer appear to be returning. But will this game continue removing what was comfortable? I guess we'll all find out when we get our hands on it and learn what Elden Ring will take from us. This video, gone. I was hungry, so I don't know if it's helping my HP.